AI vs. Artist. That is the title of my first ever AI generated artwork that you can see in here. In this video, I want to talk a little bit about what I learned while using AI for the first time and if we all have to be scared for our jobs. So ChatGPT, Midjourney version 5, Adobe Firefly and countless other releases. If you've been paying attention, you've probably been bombarded lately by lots of AI relevant news. And if you work as an artist like myself, you might be wondering where all of this journey is heading to. And if in the end, there is still a need for my work as an artist. So while ChatGPT believes it's unlikely to completely replace human artists, you also have to take that with a grain of salt because the AI has been trained to give replies which are also pleasant to read for humans. So instead of trusting on this, I wanted to try out one of the most recent releases, Midjourney 5, and see what it can do and where the limitations are and how I can use it in my current line of work. So at present, in order to communicate with the AI in Midjourney, you have to do it through their Discord server. And you can easily get an invitation to their Discord server over the website. And then you might find yourself in one of those newbie rooms in here. And here you can see a lot of stuff that people already generated. And new stuff is basically generated every moment. And you can also generate some of your own images. And this you can do through a combination of commands and prompts. So a command is, for example, here this imagine command. And that's also the most frequently used one. And then you have a prompt and we can use, for example, a monkey riding a bicycle on a busy road, then submit this. And now here's my job waiting to start. It easily gets lost in the timeline in here, but I will show you a simple way of how to fix this in a moment. So now after the image was finished, it disappeared from the spot where we saw it before and moved to the very end of the timeline. You can also find it by checking your inbox and then just jump here to the post that you just generated. And by this, it's a little bit more convenient. So let's check what kind of image we got. We got here a monkey riding a bicycle on a busy road. So I think it kind of did a quite good job in order to fill this very simple prompt. So that's basically how it works in a nutshell. So now instead of continuing here in this public room, let's use a feature that you get when you are a paying subscriber. And that is that you can invite this Midjourney bot. So that is the bot that basically generates your images to your own Discord server. So here I created my own Discord server. And then once you click in here, you can add this to the server and then select your own server and authorize this. And then the Midjourney bot will join your server. And let's add a new text channel in here. And now you can see that there's two people online in this channel. One is me and one is the Midjourney bot. So now it's much simpler what we're doing because we don't share this room with so many other people. So now let's dive in a little bit deeper and see what we can do with this. So now in here, let's generate the same image again and see what happens. So here I speeded up the progress and in total it takes roughly one minute to complete this task. Let's check out what picture we have now. You can see that we don't have exactly the same identical picture as before. Yes, we still have a monkey riding a bicycle on a busy road, but we have completely different images. So that means every time even you use the same prompt by default, Midjourney generates a completely new image from scratch. Now we can also check our settings by using the settings command. Once we do this, let's see what kind of settings we have in here. So now you can see that the default is to use Midjourney version four, but as a paying subscriber, you can use the Midjourney version five. So it's the latest version of it. So let's use that. And then let's dismiss this message in here. Let's generate the same image again in order to see what will happen. So now you can see Midjourney automatically adds this minus minus V5 in here. And that's just there as an indication that you're using the latest version of Midjourney to generate this image now. So now since our picture has been finished, let's open it up. And you can immediately see there's a very different style going on here by default compared to those pictures from Midjourney version 4. So let's open those ones up here as a comparison again. And those ones here have a much more, let's say, artistic, much more drawn kind of style by default, while the Midjourney version 5 by default has a much more photographic style. You can see those two pictures here and probably also this one here. They really look like a photograph. 
And the reason for that is that both of those different models, they have been trained on different kind of data sets. So that's why the pictures coming out of the latest version of Midjourney have a very different kind of look by default than those pictures that are coming out from earlier versions of Midjourney. So now you probably notice these different buttons down here. And we have these buttons with the U1 until U4 and they stand for upscaling. So it means I can upscale any of those four images in here. Let's upscale, for example, here the third image and press this button. And now you can see we upscaled the third image now and have it bigger with more details. Then we have this button in here that basically just resubmits the same job with exactly the same prompt. And then we have these V1 until V4 buttons and V stands for variations. So for example, we can make variations of this third image in here by pressing this one and this will submit a completely new job. So now those variations have been finished and let's open this up and see what happened. So you can see it's basically the same kind of image but there are some small variations to it. For example, in the background, you can see different kind of people. You can see the monkey looks slightly different. You can see the motorbike looks different, the car looks different and so on. But overall, it's the same kind of composition and it almost looks like the same picture if you look at it from a little bit of a distance. So that are what those variation buttons here are for. So now the question is, how can we modify this picture so let's say we have one monkey on the motorbike we like this overall picture now but let's try to add two monkeys on the motorbike and there's also a way to do this for this you first need to enter here the settings and then let's enable this remix mode in here we can also dismiss this message now again so now let's check our last picture again so for example let's say we want this picture here but let's add a different monkey in there so let's see what happens if I use this V2 button now. And now instead of creating versions using the exact same prompt like before, we now have the option to modify this prompt here. So let's try to see what happens if we change the one monkey to two monkeys and submit it again. So now those variations have been finished and let's check them out. And let's see if there's a second monkey in there. And actually, yes, in some of the images, there is a second monkey. You can see here there's one behind this monkey and it looks like this monkey has like four legs now and there's also something like a monkey here hanging on the side and in some of the other images there is not a second monkey at all and that is kind of a weakness or a problem with the current technology in mid-journey is that once the image has been generated then it's very difficult to modify the elements in the image by changing the prompt and this kind of situation, you would be much better off to start a completely new image. So now let's try this out and see what we will get. So now since those pictures are finished, let's check it out. And we can immediately see that our prompt is way better resembled in those pictures because we clearly have two monkeys sitting on one bike in a way that we kind of expected. And we get a much better result than if we try to modify an existing prompt like in those ones in here. Of course, the downside is that we completely lose our previous composition. So let's say we like this composition. We just wanted to add a second monkey in there. It's kind of impossible to get it through this way. So I said much better to start off with a better prompt from the beginning. And there's a huge amount of randomness, of course, in those pictures which are generated in mid journey. So the amount of influence you have on the picture is in a way very limited. You can't really compare it to traditional workflows where you basically just draw in a second monkey and you're able to modify those pictures completely based on your artistic skills. Also, as a side note, I just realized that I always asked to have monkeys on bicycles, but for some reason, some of those pictures here show clearly motorbikes, except the ones in Mid Journey 4, because probably we have this more like painterly style, but as soon as there's like photographs, it seems that it kind of like prefers to place the monkeys on motorbikes instead, except this one picture in here. That's the only one with a photographic style that is clearly a bicycle. But yeah, that's just something that you need to know. You kind of get unexpected results here and then, and you don't really have any guarantee in what way it will kind of follow your prompts or completely ignores them or interprets them 
kind of freely. So far I just used some very simplistic prompts and that gave Midjourney quite a huge amount of freedom to generate different kind of styles. So you can see I didn't really specify what kind of style I wanted. That's why some of those pictures look more like photographs. Some of those pictures look a little bit more like drawings and so on. So now let's try to make a much more detailed prompt and see what will happen with this. So now let's imagine an atmospheric, dark, futuristic cyberpunk style alley. It is raining with puddles of water on the floor, misty, foggy atmosphere, futuristic neon lights with Chinese characters, cinematic style with vibrant colors. So now the image is finished and let's check it out. Let's open it in a browser to get a bigger view. And let's see what it kind of did in here. And I would say all of my prompts were kind of being followed. So we have even some Chinese characters here. I have no idea if they actually make sense or not. I guess probably not because characters is a problem for Midjourney in general, but everything else is resembled. We have it raining. We have puddles of water on the floor. We have these vibrant colors, these neon lightings, this misty atmosphere and so on. Of course, there are small problems, for example, like this kind of car in here is floating. But in general, the quality of those images are really nice. And what really blows me away is that like all of those reflections here are accurately represented. You have to understand that it's not really ray tracing or doing anything like this. It's basically just calculating those pixels. It's imagining how those pixels here should look like and that those reflections match so physically accurate with the environment, even though it's not ray traced or rendered or calculated in this regard. It's really quite astonishing what kind of results you can you can get with this here. So now let's try something different. And here's an image that I found online. And what Midjourney also can do is that you can include images in your generation. And then it tries to kind of overtake elements from those images. And let's try to do this with the same prompt that we used before and this image here. So here let's check out the result. And you can see I used exactly the same prompt. The only difference was that I added the URL of the image in the very beginning. And now you can see what kind of influence this image here has on the overall picture that's being generated. So again, this one here was the image that we fed into it. And then you can get this kind of result in here. And it kind of overtook the prompt that we use. So it has these kind of reflective floor. It has these kind of vibrant colors, this neon lighting but it included this kind of reference images that we gave it. And I think for me, that is really, really quite powerful. So now let's also talk about some limitations or some kind of problem areas in my journey at the moment. And those are found mainly when I try to have interactions between, for example, different kind of characters and so on. So let's try out something new now. So let's imagine a heroic red wearing a knight armor is fighting with an evil dragon. The environment is a mountaintop with lots of rocks and sparse vegetation, very moody and atmospheric lighting, rainy mood with lightning and thunderstorms. So here you can see the finished result. Let's open this in our browser. And now let's compare it to the prompt that we gave it. And you can see it's clearly not being followed. So it has kind of problems to make these kind of more complex interactions. I think the only picture where you could somehow see a fight going on would be possibly this one in here, but it's definitely not a dragon. By the way, I really love this iron umbrella that Midjourney somehow <laughs> decided to implement. But yeah, the dragon is nowhere to be seen. And additionally, if you check closely, there are some minor problems like this red here, for example, has three feet and apparently two tails, even I didn't really ask for that. So there are these kind of weird glitches that happen now and then. Also, for example, if you try to generate hands, then those also oftentimes look extremely weird, even though that already improved a lot between version four and five. So now in the end, let me walk you through the steps that it took me to create this kind of image in here. And initially I hoped I could do the whole thing entirely in mid journey, but in the end I decided to just generate different kind of elements and then later blend them together in Photoshop because it proved to be too difficult to really get what I wanted. So initially I tried to generate just pictures of an artist looking extremely worried that AI may take over his work. You can see 
those kind of images, they don't really look very convincing, very nice in terms of composition and so on. So I try to basically break it down in smaller parts. And I first focus about trying to make some artists and I try to define the style of those pictures in here with a darker and moody background. And I think, yeah, it starts to look like this guy is very worried, but he doesn't really look like an artist. So I try to tweak it in a way that I will get an appearance of a more traditional painter, for example. So I started defining the clothes and so on. And that seemed to work okay. I just didn't really like the background. So here in this picture here, I try to focus more about having a clean background. And this is something that I start to like. So I especially like those two different characters in here. So I started first to make some variations with this first character in here. And in the end, I found actually I like this character here more. So I also generated some variations of this character. In the end, I chose this guy in here because I think here I really like the way how scared he looks like. And for my feeling, Midjourney did a really great job in capturing this image in here. So that was quite good. So the problem started a little bit with the AI that I wanted to generate. And I wanted to make the AI feel, of course, like some very technical thing. So first I started to have a robot that is dressed up as a painter. And yeah, you can see those results. They don't really look very convincing. And then I tried to generate a Terminator style robot. And here you can see it kind of had problems to generate something that looks a little bit like a robot. So all of those guys here, they all still very much look like humans. But for some reason, I liked this guy down here, even though that's not at all what I imagined and what I asked for. So I started to refine this guy and made different variations of this guy and try to make the face appear more silvery, more metallic and so on. But that was a little bit difficult. So I tried with different prompts in here. And yeah, that's not really what I wanted. It became a little bit too cartoony and so on. So I chose in the end this guy in here and I decided to try to make his face in Photoshop look a little bit more metallic. And yeah, I know it looks a bit more like a zombie. That's actually not really what I wanted to. You can also see this hand here is kind of screwed up. So it looks like there's a finger missing and so on. So in the end, I decided to use this guy. I tried a little bit to generate different kind of guys in here, different kind of robots. And I tried to make his eyes green and glowing, but for some reason he decided to make the whole character here glowing. And yeah, I tried a little bit more around different kind of variations and so on. And in the end, I just called it a day and just took one of those characters in here and then basically just tried to refine it from there because I started to get some really weird results as you can see down here. So then in the end, I took all of those elements and I threw it in Photoshop in order to create my composition. And for this guy here, originally I had the plan to have like some sci-fi robot, something very clean and polished in order to resemble some kind of advanced AI. But somehow I really like this character here. I said, even though he looks extremely like a zombie with these kind of rotten teeth in here. So I tried to compensate this a little bit by just making his skin a little bit more silvery. And I also had to replace the hand from a different image because the original hand in this image here was missing a finger. And I guess this one is potentially still missing a finger. At least it doesn't really make sense to hold the pencil like this, but it wasn't so obvious in this picture. So I took this one and then I decided to give him some green glowing eyes. And then I had Mid Journey generate me some lightning strikes. And then I also composed them back into the image. So at this point, I want to try to take a step back and kind of address the big elephant in the room right now. And that is the question on how the hell does this AI actually create these kind of images? And artificial intelligence is actually not what's really happening here. I think it's better to refer to it as machine learning. So by definition, the machine is only as good as all of the data that has been fed into it. So the big question is where does all of this data actually come from? So here you can see two images of wheat fields that are generated using Midjourney. And it becomes very obvious where the data to generate these kind of pictures here came from. So as there are traces of watermarks in the picture, 
We have to assume that the data that was used to generate these kind of pictures came from stock footage websites and these kind of watermarks you will always get if you didn't really pay for the artwork itself, if you just used a free preview. And since the data required to train these machines require millions and billions of images, those images were taken from everywhere on the internet. And in most cases, the original artist had no idea that his or her work was being used and he or she never got any compensation for his or her contribution. So this and many other ethical questions should be answered. And I linked you two different videos that I found online about this topic and I found very interesting. So you can check those out if you want to dive a little bit deeper. AI companies themselves have no intention to answer these kind of questions and instead wrap everything in marketing friendly words such as the democratization of art and so on. But if you just take one thing away from this video, I hope that it's to be aware that whenever you use these kind of image generators, you're basically using the collective work of millions of artists worldwide who unwillingly contributed with their work to train this kind of machine and now find themselves in a position where they possibly have to compete against their collective self. And that, at least for me, is something that I can never ignore. So this video here was not really meant as a very detailed tutorial about Midjourney. There are already tons of those out there. But I just wanted to give you a rough overview about the current state of the technology. And now let's try to wrap this up and answer the question on if AI will take over your job. And I think this is very difficult to predict, but it depends also a lot on in which kind of area you're working or what kind of art you're producing. So for example, if you work in concept design, then image generators, even in its current state, I would say already pose quite a big threat because they can produce quite good results in a very short amount of time with actually no skills required except typing in a few words. And we already had the case where AI generated art won against humans in traditional art competitions. So it would be very naive to assume that there would be no implications at all for the future. So I myself work in 3D animation, lighting, rendering and so on. And I assume that AI will also make its big entrance into this area. But at the moment, it's not really clear yet, at least from my perspective, where this all will lead to. I can see that there are already early attempts to use machine learning for parts of this job, such as material generation or 3D modeling. But those, at least to me, still seem to be in its early stages of development. Also, at least in my imagination, the amount of data that's available to train a 3D modeling algorithm is much smaller compared to the data set that software like Midjourney can access. So it remains to be seen how well these kind of technologies will actually be implemented in the end. So predicting the future is of course extremely difficult and we have no idea about how this technology will evolve in the next months and years. At the moment it seems there's a huge push in order to implement AI in many kind of areas. And I think as an artist, you are best advised to basically follow these kind of developments and also try to find ways and workflows to integrate this new technology in your work in order to stay competitive. At the same time, I think it's good advice to trust and especially continue developing your own skills because at the moment, nobody really knows where this will all lead to. There's this big hype at the moment, but you can see that these kind of technologies they still have their flaws and they're not perfect in every regard. So I think it's always good to trust in yourself and to try to improve yourself as good as you can.